Good afternoon, Colonel Contra. It's been a while since we were here, but we're ready for our first return episode of Colonel's Corner. We're here with Wilkes University football head coach, John Drock. Coach, thanks for joining us. No problem, Adam. It's good to be here virtually. <laughs> and we're happy to talk to you. Um, so obviously, over the last five months, um, it's been a different time for us all. I don't know about you, but for me, it's felt like time has gone slow and fast at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. what, have you, what have you been up to for the last five months? It's been tough. When the kids left in March, you know, the focus was so much on helping them academically and helping them in the transition as we went through online classes and we did everything we could for the guys um, to make that transition as seamless as possible. And actually we had one of our better semesters we've ever had academically. We're actually above a 3.0 for our team GPA, which was fantastic. So we were super excited about that. Um, and then we just kept hacking away at plans because we didn't really know how things were going to fall. You know what I mean? That at one time the Mac had planned on playing and now we're not playing. So just creating an experience for our players when they come back is something we had a priority on. Um, I've done a lot myself, spent a lot of time with our, my kids. I have a two-year-old um, and a five-year-old, and they're both constantly moving. You know what I mean? So having time to, to be with them and, and actually spend some time with the family was fantastic. Um, and then working myself, too. I've been running a lot and working out as much as we possibly can and trying to stay on pace with some of my own personal goals that I have as well. So it's been a busy five months, but it's definitely something that I think you know, we've gotten a lot out of it and hopefully gotten a little bit better off the field and we continue to kind of work on some of those things. Now, let's talk about last season again. Um, the Colonels went from 0-10 in 2017, obviously the year before you got here, and then to 6-4 and in 2018. And then last year, an 8-2 and regular season and a bowl game. How do we keep the arrow pointed upward for the Gridiron Colonels? I think we just got to kind of continue to do our 1% every day and you know, go keep attacking every day. I think that's the model that we started with and we never were really looking at outcomes. Um, so for us, it was just a day-to-day -day basis and how can we find a way to get better today? And um, whether that's academically, whether that's football, that's always been the message. And so we didn't have to change much in this quarantine time period. And now that we're not playing, we still don't have to change much. We still have time to get better. We still have time to get bigger and stronger and faster. We have time to be better students. And so, you know, we're really going to focus on those things, I think on a day-to-day -day basis and not worry about what that outcome is. That's got us where we are. It's a process-driven outcome. You know, and so we're really focused on our process because we know if we focus on that, the outcomes are going to happen for us. And we have had success, but I still think we're hungry to achieve higher. And, and making those changes as we move forward is something for us that we're going to kind of continue to work on. Now, you touched on it a little bit already with the Middle Atlanta Conference um, moving around due to, obviously, the COVID pandemic. Um, they announced the potential to play fall sports in the spring. What are your thoughts on that potentially happening? You know, I think it's going to be different for everybody. Um, as far as football goes, I don't know that I'm for playing a, a complete season. I think we've had talks with the conference as far as the coaching staff goes, and we put some recommendations together for the conference. I think we need to focus on the development of our kids. Like our guys didn't get spring ball. They don't get fall football. So they're going to be a little bit behind in that capacity. Any scrimmage opportunities or game opportunities we get are fantastic, but there's also some stipulations with the NCA of not using eligibility and those types of things. I think we'll try to do everything we can to preserve eligibility for our kids so they can have a full football experience in 21. Um, I think that playing, if you were to play a full season in the spring with playoffs and whatnot, it's going to be pretty hard to turn around in four months and play another complete season. You know, there's no level of football that's really ever done that. And with the amount of contact, the possibility for injuries, the head contacts. I just don't think it's the safest thing to go about it that way. I think we're excited to get on the field and practice and play some version of competition, but I don't really see it being a full season of play. Now let's talk a little bit about you. Obviously, your playing career, you're a Division One quarterback at Western Michigan. What was mm -hmm. it like playing Division One football? I mean, I had a blast. Um, coming out of high school and playing for my dad in high school was a pretty unique experience. And then when I went to college, he actually retired for a few years and kind of got a chance to follow me around and watch me play. And we got to play at some really, really neat venues. And I got to make a lot of great relationships. And I'm still friends with a lot of those guys I, I played with. I have a text message chain on my phone that goes back 
almost 20 years now <laughs> to that we, we've been talking and kind of keeping up those relationships as we've gone. And, um, we won a lot, you know, I got to play in a couple of Mac championships in that time. And uh, we got to play down at Florida. My first collegiate experience I ever had was at university of Florida. And uh, I was a true freshman and I wasn't supposed to travel. And unfortunately some, the quarterbacks in front of me made a poor decision two nights before the game. And the offensive coordinator, Bill Cubic, came to me and said, hey, you're traveling this week. Don't F it up. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so I was the backup quarterback going in to go play Steve Spurrier in 1999. And it was a pretty unique experience. You get there and the, the grass is like putting green grass uh, all over that field. It's the loudest place to this day I've ever been. Uh, I've never experienced a louder venue than uh, in that bowl. And it's definitely a humbling experience to get to play in front of that many people. Uh, we played um, the first game after 9-11 at the University of Michigan. And there was over 117,000 people there. And having that big flag and every standing, that was an emotional time. You, you, you know what I mean? And I think for me as a player, I remember all those experiences more than the wins and losses. You know what I mean? And had a lot of fun. And got to beat our rival Central Michigan four out of my five years and had a big part of that a few years. And, you know, um, my playing career wasn't always perfect. You know what I mean? I got beat out going into my senior year and started half the year and had to earn that spot back. And it was a lot for me of tenacity and staying with it and kind of some of those things that I learned as I was coming up that really came to fruition for me throughout my career. And those are a lot of things I kind of carried with me as I went on from playing the division one college level, but made a lot of great relationships and playing with guys like Greg Jennings and Jason Babin and Tony Scheffler and all those guys had long NFL careers. They, uh, they made me look good more often than once. Gee, cell phone conversations going back 20 years. Did they have cell phones back then? Barely, barely. We had Nextel direct connect. I don't know if you remember that last <laughs> time, but we could, uh, we could beep each other. Uh, you know what I mean? So uh, it's, uh, like I said, I think football builds a lot of those bonds and the locker room builds a lot of those bonds. And those are things that don't change over time. And I got to live with a lot of those guys for four years. So, um, we had some special times that we can talk about with the kids maybe after graduation. So now let's continue with your career. Don't want to put you on the spot here, but we dug into your stats a little and I got to look at my notes here. We saw that <laughs> in 2001, you ran for 124 yards. And then in 2002, you ran for Negative four yards. Would you say that was a sophomore slump? <laughs> no, I would say that it got to take a lot of knees that year. You know what I mean? Um, so I think uh, as we, we played and we had different offensive coordinators and all that kind of stuff, my game changed a lot too. When I was a young player, I just wanted to run the whole time. And then as I got better and I was a stronger player, I actually stood in the pocket a little bit longer and hopefully made some better decisions with the ball down the field to make Greg and those guys look better. So um, I think it's just a matter of opportunity more than anything else in philosophy. Now, before you came to Wilkes, you were a quarterback's coach and offensive coordinator at Hobart College, historically a very strong program. Um, while you were there, um, for those people that may not know at home that are watching this, Hobart had an offensive lineman named Ali Marpet drafted in 2015, 61st overall, the highest ever draft pick for a Division three player. When Marpet was at Hobart, did you and the rest of the Statesman coaching staff kind of know that he was an offensive talent the way that he turned out to be? We knew he was really special, and I had the privilege of recruiting Allie. So um, in my time there, I got to recruit a lot of really good players, and I think I had seven or eight first-team All-Americans, and Allie was one of those guys. Um, from the second I watched Allie's high school film, I knew he was a special kid. Um, he was slightly undersized at the time because he was probably 245 or 250, but he had the range and the length. And a lot of things, one thing that people don't know about Allie is Allie didn't play football his junior year. He was a, uh, a basketball player. And so the first time I met Allie, I was actually recruiting the quarterback at the high school and the quarterback brought Allie over to me and introduced him. He's like, he's going to play this year. And I was like, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more. You know what I mean? And he had the frame and you could tell that he had the size and he had the drive. He was such a motivated kid to be successful. 
and he was a successful student. And to be honest with you, had he not gone to play in the NFL, I think he would have been on Wall Street, and I think he would have been just as successful. Oh, you know, wow. so he was that type of kid that was just super, super motivated in everything he did, and he made people around him that much better. I mean, some of the things I watched him do in college did make me feel like he was ready for the big time. He, I think to this day, he's one of the only prospects to be over a 30 rep bench guy at 225, jump over a 30 inch vertical, weigh over 300 pounds, have over a 30 score on the Wonderlic test. And I think jump over a hundred on the broad jump. Like he just checked every box. He was smart, he was athletic, he was fast, he was long. And it's not a surprise to me that he's a leader on that Tampa Bay Bucks football team. You know what I mean? He's been, I think, their player rep for the last couple of years. He's been a team captain the last couple of years down there. That was all in him from the first day he stepped on campus. He was a two-year captain at Hobart, his junior and his senior year. And the guy just worked tirelessly. He woke up in the middle of the night to eat because he knew he needed to gain weight. So he would eat every three hours, and he would have an alarm set that he would wake up and eat and then he would come in and train and just it was mind-blowing how much he underwent a change while he was with us but man i can't give any more credit to that kid than anybody just because he did most of it himself like i said he didn't have the lavish support staff that i had as a division one athlete you know what i mean and he put all that work in himself and he's really got himself to where he is i couldn't be more proud of that kid but um he's an awesome person more than anything else and now he gets to play with tom brady you can't beat that he does. He does. We actually had a couple other kids that year that were really, really good too. I think one of the biggest things that helped Ali was having Tyree Coleman, who was actually the division three defensive player of the year that year. So watching those two go at it every day, it was like watching a division one practice because they were just both beasts in their fields. And I think they both made so much each other so much stronger. And that's one of the reasons why we were able to make it to the elite eight. And those guys really carried us. And you add in, Devin Worthington and Steve Webb and we just had so much talent at that point that uh, we were very very fortunate uh, in recruiting and we were very very fortunate that those guys wanted to be a part of our program. Now let's talk about Wilkes-Barre a little obviously you've been here I think three years now. This will be our third going into three. So what's your uh, you've had a little more time to explore the area the last two years. What's your favorite restaurant in the Wilkes-Barre area? Favorite restaurant? Um, Janelle and I love Cork. Um, it's a restaurant uh, just over on the other side of town. Uh, really good sit-down restaurant. Great Italian food, fresh, that kind of stuff. And then me and the staff love Franklin's on the square. I love Franklin's. They, uh, they treat us right down there. That's our post-game hangout. Go get some food and a beer and relax down there. And uh, I think that both of those places are places I would highly recommend if you're uh, stopping through Los Bear. I love Franklin's. I had the Cuban there once. It was amazing. Yeah, it's very good. Um, now, all of the football coaches at Wilkes are grouped together in the Minor Mode House right next to the Bart Center. Yep. Who would you say has the messiest office of all the assistant coaches? That is not even close. It's Kelvin Cruz. Um, we are constantly picking up after Kelvin. He has all kinds of trinkets, and he loves, like, anime and all that kind of stuff. So he's got stuff all over his office, and uh, we constantly are razzing him a little bit with his clothes and everything else. But – uh, for the most part, we do keep it pretty clean. I'm kind of a neat freak as far as that goes. So I think that how you run your program and how you have your desk is a direct reflection on how you do your work. So being organized and those things. But I think if we had to pick one, it would definitely be Kelvin. I can't knock on Kelvin too much because I used to have a bunch of trinkets on my desk until Vince, <laughs> Vince used to make fun of me and I finally got rid of them. <laughs> um, now, let's finally, obviously, no interview would be complete without talking about people's pets. Yeah. I've seen you walking a dog on campus before. Can you tell us about him? Yeah. Chief is in the office almost every day. So Chief is about a 110-pound yellow lab. Uh, he's almost three years old. He's a big dog. Um, and uh, you can probably hear him barking over in the Mart Center every now and then. But uh, the guys love him. He's out in our study hall room. And he loves being around the team. And he loves walking around campus. And um, a couple of our film girls come over and walk him all the time and take him through campus. And he is a fun loving dog and he's full of energy. So you'll see me out throwing the ball for him in the backyard. And uh, like I said, he's with me almost every day. And for me, it's, it's a huge comfort to have him here, but then the guys that have animals at home, 
get to have a pet when they're over in the house. And it really makes that home environment, makes that home feel. And it's something for us that kind of builds that family atmosphere. You know what I mean? And I think some guys come in and just watch TV in my office and, and pet the dog for 20 minutes and hang out. I know when we have our quarterback meetings and free COVID, we would do in my, in my office. And we've had five or six guys in here and chief would be sitting on somebody's lap. And he's, like I said, he's not a small animal, um, but those guys will just sit there and pet him for the hour that they're in our meeting. And uh, he's a lot of fun. I love to hunt with him and we do a ton of stuff outside of here too. So he keeps me pretty active on a consistent basis as well. Obviously, we all love dogs. All right, Coach Jock, Wilkes University football coach. I want to thank you for joining us, being our first guest on Colonel's Corner under quarantine. <laughs> Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you in the Thanks, fall. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it, man. Like I said, um, stay safe out there, be healthy, and look forward to getting everybody back here in the end of August. And we'll see you soon. All right, thanks, Coach. No problem. Bye-bye.